you're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is December 6, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Abbas Chapter 3, Leukocyte Circulation and Migration into Tissues. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's Chief of the Section of Clinical Immunology in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. So, today is December 6, 2021, and I'm Nikita Raji. I'm presenting uh, Chapter 3 from Textbook of Abbas, Leukocyte Circulation and Migration into Tissues. So, let's get started. I don't have any disclosures. Here are our learning objectives to recognize the types of adhesion molecules and to learn the pattern of migration of various types of leukocytes. So a couple of questions for pretest, and we'll come back to these. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to give you a minute to read those. Here's our outline for today. Let's get started. A long chapter. Lots of new terminology and lots of new concepts, um, but really interesting. And so, uh, let's see, let's start with overview of leukocyte migration. So the movement of immune cells is constant, it's highly regulated, and it's purposeful. Um, so before we go on to look at that purpose and what is the function of the, the movement of immune cells, let's look at some of the I realized I did not start slideshow. Okay. Um, so, again, the movement is constant, highly regulated, and purposeful. And let's look at these definitions before we talk about the functions of that movement. So, what is migration? It is also called recruitment. It is just the general process of leukocyte movement from blood into the tissues. So, you'll, you'll see that we use these terms interchangeably migration or recruitment of leukocytes. Then there is a term called homing. And again, getting used to these terms is really important because we'll use this pretty much frequently when we move into more discussion. Um, so migration of leukocyte out of the blood circulation into a particular tissue or site of infection is called homing. And it almost sounds like it is. those are pretty similar definitions. But I would think of homing as basically thinking of more of the tissue in which the, the leukocyte is moving versus when we talk about recruitment, we are talking about that movement um, from blood to wherever it's going. And then there is a term called recirculation, and this is the ability of the lymphocytes to repeatedly home to secondary lymphoid organs, reside there transiently, and then return to the circulation. And there is a purpose to that as well. So what is the migration map of these cells? Where do they go from one place? To, how do they go from one place to another? So if it's a myeloid cell, they are produced in the primary lymphoid organ, right, in the bone marrow. Then they enter the circulation, and they continue to be in the circulation till they are needed. And when they are needed in a tissue, they are going to move to the tissue. That's all they do, going from... Lymphoid, primary lymphoid organ to blood circulation, that's where they are going to continue to circulate and then go into tissues. Whereas lymphocytes are different. Depending on the phase of the lymphocyte, they might end up in different places. For example, if it's a naive lymphoid cell, it goes from primary lymphoid organ where it's produced to the circulation and then it's going to go to secondary lymphoid organ. But a naive lymphocyte is typically not going to go into the tissues. It's going to, that naive cell is going to stay in the secondary lymphoid organ till it is activated. And once it's activated, it becomes differentiated into an effector lymphoid cell. And now from that secondary lymphoid organ, it's going to move to circulation and then go into the tissues. So very methodical depending on the type of the cell or uh, phase of the cell. And that's what this figure shows as well. So there are a few principles of migration. They follow some rules. 
In general, there is temporary adhesion of molecules on the leukocytes with endothelial cells of the blood vessels so that they can move from lymphoid organs to the blood circulation or from the blood circulation and then into the tissue cells, sorry, then into the tissues using the adhesion molecules um, that can adhere to the tissue cells. And then the endothelial cells themselves also express adhesion molecules and chemokines. The expression is in, for, for these chemokines on these endothelial cells is increased by cytokines at that site of infection. So cytokines are released by macrophages or tissue cells. And then if you think of the leukocytes, they uh, express adhesion molecules just like the endothelial cells, but they also express chemokine receptors. So let's look at these adhesion molecules. What are these adhesion molecules? So there are two types, lectins and selectin ligands, and integrins or two groups, integrins and integrin ligands. So there are four total types of uh, adhesion molecules, but there are two groups. So selectins bind to selectin ligands, integrins bind to integrin ligands. And then we'll talk about the third type, which is the chemokine that bind to chemokine receptors. So let's talk about selectins and selectin ligands. So what does selectin mean? So the name itself suggests, so the lectin part of that selectin means that they are surface proteins that bind to carbohydrates. So when you talk about selectins, these are selected lectins. So they are surface proteins that bind carbohydrates, but they are selected that are meant for adhesion molecules. So carbohydrate binding protein adhesion molecules are called selectins. Selectin ligands, what are these? So they bind to the selectins, right? So the ligands are silylated carbohydrate groups of Lewis X and Lewis A family. So they have a core that is silylated and fucosylated. It has fucosylated moieties. So basically there are some molecules on that in that group that are either silylated or fucosylated and that's important for them to bind to those selectins. So these are present on glycoproteins of various cells. So the function of these selectins and selectin ligands is low affinity adhesion and we'll come back to that concept. So here are the different types of selectins, P-selectin, L-selectin L and E-selectin. So Pretty easy to remember, CD62 is the marker, depending on which one we are talking about, you can think about it, it as CD62 L, E or P. Typically, P and E selectin are the ones that are more per, uh, prominently present on endothelial cells, and then L selectin is present on various leukocytes. And the ligand, so the, this P selectin on the endothelial cells will interact with its ligand, so selectin ligand, and it will interact typically with that Sal Lewis X moiety on PSGL. So what's PSGL? It's P-selectin glycoprotein ligand type 1. And so there are different types of glycoprotein ligand, uh, and they have some kind of silylated or fucosylated moiety on them. So the, if the selectin is on endothelium, we need this ligand to be on the leukocyte. That's the how they interact with the endothelium to move around, right, in the circulation, from the circulation to the tissues or from the tissues to circulation. Um, so uh, similarly, E-selectin also binds to the um, selectin ligand, for example, with other glycoproteins that have cellulose X, such as CLA1, so cutaneous lymphocyte antigen type 1. Again, the ligands are on the cells, E and P selectin are on the endothelium. On the other hand, L selectin is on the leukocytes, whereas its ligand, which is called glycam1 or medcam1, these are present on various endothelial cells, typically the high endothelial venule cells. So that's how the L-selectin on the leukocytes binds to the selectin ligand on the, in the venules, and that's how it migrates. So here the term PNAD stands for peripheral node addressin. 
So in the peripheral lymph nodes, there is this, it's called adresin because that's like, you know, the overall the system of adhesion molecules and chemokines is meant for their movement. And if you think about like GPS or addresses that they are trying to follow, it's a, um, it's a address that this L-selectin is trying to go to. And because it's... Um, partner, which is glycam-1 or medcam-1, is present in the endothelium. That's where it goes. Now we talk about the other set of adhesion molecules called integrins, and then we'll talk about integrin ligands. So integrins are heterodimeric proteins. So remember, selectins were proteins that were binding to carbohydrate moieties. Now here, integrins are proteins that are made up of two chains. So they are heterodimer. They have an alpha chain and a beta chain. So these, so the integrins contain two non-covalently linked polypeptide chains, and they are either uh, there are they can choose from different types of alpha chain and different types of beta chain to form those different combinations. So there are thirty different ones, and they can bind to different combinations between alpha and beta to form those heterodimers. The extracellular head of this integrin binds to the ligands, so integrin ligands, and the intracellular domain interacts with the cytoskeletal components in the cell, such as actin and tropomyosin. What do actin and tropomyosin do? They help with the motility, right? So once the ligand is bound to the extracellular domain, the intracellular domain integrates signals with the cytoskeletal dependent um, signals with the those um, components to help with motility, shape change, or phagocytic responses. So here are the different integrins, LFA1, MAC1, VLA4, alpha4, beta7. So regardless of which integrin it is, it has two chains. One is an alpha chain, one is a beta chain. So for LFA1, CD11A is the alpha chain, CD18 is the beta chain. Again, MAC1, alpha chain is different, beta chain is the same. So uh, same thing with VLA4, or alpha 4, beta 7. Both of them have CD29 as their beta chain. Their CD, so their alpha chain is different. So here it's alpha 4. Here it might be a different alpha, which is called CD49A. Regardless of what integrin it is, it's going to bind to the integrin ligand. Integrin ligands are typically called go by the name CAMS, C-A-M-S. So CAM means cellular adhesion molecules. So ICAM is intercellular um, adhesion molecules, whereas VCAM is vascular cell adhesion molecules. So they go by the CAM, so there are different types of CAMs or cellular adhesion molecules, which are integrins again. So remember, uh, sorry, they are integrin ligands. And so the different integrins ligands bind to different in integrins. Some of these li uh, integrins, sorry, integrins are present on the leukocytes versus the CAMs are present on the endothelium in different places. So different, different site endothelium would have different CAMs such as um, the VCAM1 or MedCAM1 is present in the endothelium in gut and gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So depending on where that CAM is located, different types of integrins bind to those. Now we talk about the third type of molecule called chemokine, and we'll talk about chemokine receptors. So what are chemokines? They are also known as chemotactic cytokines. If this is a family of structurally homolo homologous cytokines that stimulate leukocyte movement and regulate the migration of leukocytes from the blood to the tissues. There are different families of these chemokines, but they all have cysteine residues. So that's C stands for the cysteine residue. Based on the number of cysteine residues, there are different families. So there is a family called C family, which has a single cysteine residue, whereas um, the CC family has two adjoining cysteine residues. CXC means this X stands for any other amino acid. So those CXC have two cysteine residues that are separated by one amino acid. 
And then CX3C means that there are three intervening amino acids between two cysteine residues. So there are different, these are the different types of families of chemokines and they can go, so the CC family is also called beta chemokines, CXC are called alpha chemokines. These are the most pr um, pr uh, uh, known or studied chemokines, whereas we only know one chemokine for the CX3C family. All right, so where are these produced from? The CC and CXC, so beta and alpha, the chemokines are produced by leukocytes and tissue cells such as epithelial cells, endothelial cells, fibroblasts. When are they produced? They are induced by recognition of microbes through various innate receptors or when there is presence of inflammatory cytokines such as TNF, IL-1 or IL-17. CC are produced by activated T cells. That, so they are a link between an adaptive immune uh, response and so there is a they help with the recruitment of inflammatory cytokines once those T cells produce these chemokines. So these chemokines that the different families that we talk about interact with chemokine receptors. So remember chemokine receptors are on the surface of a cell on this uh, and so these chemokine receptors are a seven transmembrane GTP binding G protein coupled receptors, which is called GPCR superfamily. They belong to this superfamily. And here is a small figure I have shown. So they go they go across the cell membrane seven times, and so they are called seven transmembrane um, receptors. So how do they help? They initiate intracellular responses through associated G proteins. So on the internal side, so the external part of it is what's going to interact with the chemokine. The internal part has the G protein that is going to, once this receptor is engaged, it's going to stimulate cytoskeletal changes and polymerization of actin and myosin filaments, resulting in the cell motility. The other function of chemokine and chemokine receptor interaction is increase in integrin affinity for their ligands. Remember the integrins just we talked about that also helps with movement. So we'll talk about how that affinity increases. But there, if there is a, too much exposure to the chemokine, these receptors are down-regulated from the surface. So there, should, there wouldn't be an excess of movement because if there is too much chemokine, then these receptors are going to internalize themselves. So just like the chemokine families, there are chemokine receptor families and they go hand in hand with the chemokine families. So CCR families are for CC chemokines, CXCRs are for the CXC chemokines, CX3CR, there is only one, and that's for CX3CL1 chemokine. And so these receptors are present on the leukocytes. Among them, T cells have the most type and number of chemokine receptors on them. So here's a list, and though it seems like there are plenty and it's hard to memorize all of these, there are some that you do have to memorize. Um, and so I think they have done a pretty good job when we were fellows. I think it was a very long list because they just went numerically from CCL1 to whatever the number is. And even though there were so many, we were trying to <clears throat> figure out which ones do we need to memorize and kind of which are clinically important. And here, now they only have the ones that are relevant, honestly. So you should be able to actually look at these and at least have some idea of what they do. Um, so among those, I'll point out a few and you can go through the full list. CCR2 is important for monocyte recruitment. CCR5 is important because, one, it helps in recruitment of these different cells, but also it is a re receptor that is used by HIV for entry. Same with CXCR5 that is used, so, sorry, CXCR4 and CCR5 are the two receptors, chemokine receptors that HIV uses for entry into the cell and pathogenesis. Then 
just like any other immunology chapter and immunology terminology, there are two names to each of these. And the, the numbers are used so that they could uh, make it more uniform not naming, but there are these older names or original names that are still kind of in play and we use these such as CCL11 and CCL17, CCL5. These three are important for allergic processes. Um, so Rantes, Eotexin and TARC. So Eotexin and TARC are really important for, um, for atopy, uh, atopic dermatitis, things like that. Rantes uh, is something that you get tested on. It's a uh, acronym for a uh, T cell um, T cell related um, chemokine, um, but again, you are um, you are supposed to memorize that. Uh, regulated upon activation, normal T cell expressed and secreted. So not fun, but something that I would say that you at least need to be aware of. Um, CCR7, really important uh, chemokine receptor that is important for entry into the lymph uh, lymph nodes or other uh, T cell zones of other uh, lymphoid, secondary lymphoid organs. CCR7 can bind to chemokine CCL19 and CCL21. Again, CCR9 and CCR10 are important for homing to intestine or skin. And so CCR9 goes along with CCL25 and CCR10 with CCL27. So some of these are really important clinically as well. Among the CXCL ones, I'll point out IL-8 or CXCL8, which is really important for neutrophil um, recruitment. So wherever you read CXCL8 or IL-8, think of neutrophils. All right. CXCR4 is important for B cell migration. CXCR5 is also important for B cell migration. So CXCL12 and CXCL13. And we'll talk about, we'll come across this again in this chapter. So we'll talk about it, but important for B cell. CCR7 important for T cell. Okay. And then these XCL1 is one of the C chemokine, which is important for T cell and NK cells. And this one, CX3C, so CX3CL1 is the only CX3C chemokine that we know of and is also important for different cells here. All right, so how do the chemokines work? They help in recruitment of leukocytes, development of lymphoid organs, and regulate the traffic of lymphocytes and other leukocytes to peripheral lymphoid organs. They help in migration of dendritic cells from the site of infection to the draining lymph node. Now, this is an important concept. So we talked about how selectins bind to selectin ligands, integrins bind to integrin ligands. But even with that, the integrins just bind to that integrin ligand, but it's the low affinity binding is provided by selectin and selectin ligands. So how do integrins provide high affinity binding? And for that, chemokines are really important. So, um, the what is inside out signaling that I'm talking about that gives the high affinity. It's the ability to respond to the intracellular signals by rapidly increasing their affinity for their ligands. What does that mean? Let's think about a cell that is in the circulation. And then it, the selectin, there is a selectin that binds to selectin ligand and that gives them the low affinity adhesion. Then the chemokine that is released, it binds to the chemokine receptors on the cells. And that helps in the binding that occurs between the integrins and the integrin ligands. So here, integrin is bound to the integrin ligand. Once that happens, the loose attachment of that integrin, if you see the shape of the integrin here, is different from the shape here, where it's tightly bound to its ligand. So initially there is low affinity integrin, but because the chemokine is bound to chemokine receptor, the binding between integrin and the ICAM is more, um, more tighter and gives high affinity binding. 
How does that happen? So if you think about it, that chemokine and chemokine receptor interaction occurs outside the cell. But because of that, there is change in the shape of the integrin inside that helps in providing that high affinity. So initially, the low affinity um, integrin is actually just bent over. It's just relaxed. And when it occurs in presence of chemokine and chemokine receptors, it becomes more alert and more tight to give that high affinity, uh, high affinity binding. So there is conformational change in the extracellular domains of the integrins that occurs because of the chemokine and chemokine receptor interaction that leads to intracellular changes. That's called inside-out signaling. So chemokines induce membrane clustering of integrins, increase avidity and tighter binding of leukocytes to the endothelium. So this is a newer concept, atypical chemokine receptors. So we talked about the chemokine receptors and the various families that go hand in hand with the chemokine families. Now there are something else called atypical chemokine receptors or ACKRs. They do not engage the G protein pathway that is used for chemokine and chemokine receptor uh, signaling. And these are involved in inhibiting or terminating the chemokine res uh, responses. There are four known human ACKRs and they bind most of the inflammatory chemokines with high affinity. One of them is called ACKR1 or DARC, D-A-R-C. Um, and these ACKRs signal through a pathway dependent on G-protein uh, regulatory proteins called beta arrestins. So in general, thinking of chemokine receptors, atypical chemokine receptors are the ones that inhibit the response of the chemokines. All right, so we now have the framework that we needed to understand how the leukocyte endothelial interaction works and how they are recruited into the tissue. So we needed to know about the various adhesion molecules, selectin, selectin ligands, integrins, integrin ligands, and we needed to know about chemokines and chemokine receptors. And so with that framework in mind, now we talk about how these cells move from the circulation to the tissues. So here, I always feel like I like to think of um, uh, think of us as physicians on call. So think of neutrophil as one of the cell that is important for uh, first response to infection. So in those terms, let's think of this, say there is a cell um, and, you know, any it could be any cell, but in the tissue, there are macrophages. And say if that tissue gets an infection or injury, those macrophages are going to release cytokines. Those cytokines are messenger molecules that reach the circulation and tell the neutrophils that they, need, they are needed. In those cases, neutrophils slow, um, have to come to the site of uh, infection and help that to fight that infection. So for that, they have to move through the circulation, come out of the circulation and move to the tissue that is uh, infected. So how does that happen? So think of you on call and you are going on a freeway and are paged. You receive that page and you are needed urgently at the hospital. What are you going to do? You are on the freeway, right? You are moving in the fast lane and driving on a fa in the fast lane. And now you are supposed to go to go back to the hospital from where you were driving home. In those cases, you are likely going to move to the slower lane and then take an exit from the freeway and go to the hospital again. So same thing for these neutrophils. The only difference is neutrophils are on call 24-7. They are on call 24-7. They are moving on that freeway in the circulation and they are in the fast lane. So in that fast lane, they cannot just bind to the endothelium. When they have to, they are called upon. So when they get paged, they actually have to move from that fast lane of the circulation to the slower lanes and where they come across different adhesion molecules so that they can apply brakes. So I think of these adhesion molecules as applying brakes. So they have to have those brakes or adhesion molecules on their surface to get out of the circulation, come to a complete stop, take an exit, 
from that freeway or from the endothelium and then go to the site of infection. So these adhesion molecules or breaks are different types. So the first one, they, they helps them to come to a rolling stop and then uh, the, uh, which are selectins and then the integrins are the one that bring them to a complete stop. And then the chemokines are the ones that help them um, make sure that integrin interaction is high affinity one. So how does that process work? So once that message reaches the leukocytes, they move from the fast lane to the slower lane. Then there is the, there are that selectin ligands on the cell that bind to selectins on the surface of the endothelium so that they come to a rolling stop, which means it's almost like a Velcro. They attach and then detach, attach and then detach from that uh, selectins. Then the chemokine-mediated uh, integrins, who are, so, so in general, I would think of it as the integrins binding to integrin ligands. So now remember, integrin ligands are on the endothelium and the integrins themselves are on the, site, on the cells. So selectin ligands and integrins are on the cell and selectins and integrin ligands are on the endothelium. So they bind to each other with that, those integrins binding to integrin li ligands on the or ICAMs on the uh, endothelial cells to come to a complete stop. During that process, the chemokines bind to chemokine receptors. Chemokine receptors are on the cell. Chemokines are released, and so they can and on the on endothelium, and so they bind to the chemokine receptor on the cell that helps in increasing the affinity of integrins to their ligand. The end result is that these, this cell comes to a complete stop on the surface of the endothelium. And then there are changes in the shape, changes in motility, because the myosin and actin are, um, are activated in, in, inside the cell. Once that happens, it's going to come uh, help in, uh, to get out of the circulation. And that happens because of a process called transmigration. That transmigration occurs through the endothelium, so it could be paracellular, so between the cells of endothelium, or transcellular. And there is a molecule called CD31 that's present on the cell as well as on the endothelium. So that helps in just a transient disruption of, the, um, of this um, matrix protein. Uh, and because of that, there is a space create, created that helps these cells to come out of the circulation. Once they come out of the circulation, they follow the scent of these chemokines and reach the site where they are needed. So the, that's how the uh, leukocytes um, interact with the endothelial surface and move to the tissues. So what happens when these breaks don't work? there is a defect that occurs that is called leukocyte adhesion defect. And so that is different types. Leukocyte type, type 1 is caused by defect in CD18. Remember, CD18 is the uh, beta integrin part of LFA1 and MAC1. So integrins have alpha and beta chains, and CD18 is a type of a beta chain that's important for integrins like LFA1 and MAC1. When that's defective, you get leukocyte adhesion type 1, and this defect occurs in, uh, or presents early in life with uh, delayed separation of umbilical cord, high neutrophil counts, and severe infections. And that's what we know of as leukocyte adhesion defect. However, there are two different, two other types of leukocyte adhesion defects. Type 2, is caused by lack of Golgi fucose transporter that's needed to express carbohydrate ligands like Sial Lewis X of E and P selectins on neutrophils. So that Sial Lewis X is fucosylated moiety. And because that Golgi fucose transporter is affected, there is a defect in Sial Lewis X of these selectins. So remember, LAD1 is an integrin defect, LAD2 is a selectin defect. And this one, uh, patients present a little later in life, it's milder, less, less infections, more of a development and growth retardation is an issue. And then three, 
what's a problem here? There is a signaling pathway defect linking chemokine receptor to integrin activation. So remember that inside out signaling where the chemokine binds to chemokine receptor and in turn increases the affinity of integrin to its ligand, that's affected and that's caused by a defect in a gene called kindlin 3 or, or a molecule called kindlin 3. All right, so we talked about how those leukocytes can come out of the circulation. Now we talk about different cells and where they migrate, right? We saw a picture in the initial part of the chapter where we talked about how it moves from um, myeloid, myeloid cells move from the periphery, from the circulation to the tissues or lymphocytes, they move from uh, different places depending on the phase. So let's talk about the myeloid cells. So neutrophils, remember the first responders, they have receptors like CXCR1 and CXCR2. Again, I told you, remember CXCL8, think of neutrophils when you hear CXCL8 or IL8. So that's produced by macrophages at the tissue infection site. And once that's released, the neutrophils get that message and use these chemokine receptors to bind to that chemokine CXCL8. Monocytes are late responders. They use CCR2 to bind to chemokines like CCL2 or MCP1. And then non-classical monocytes have CX3CR1 and that binds to the chemokine CX3CL1. Let's talk about, this is an important concept, migration and recirculation of T lymphocytes. So here is a lymph node and there is a high endothelial venule. At all the times, from the blood vessel, there are lymphocytes that enter the lymph node through the high endothelial venule. Most of these are naive T cells that, are, that have not met their antigen. When they meet their cognate antigen, uh, they have to be uh, retained into the lymph node for a longer time. But if they do not recognize any antigen while they are there in the lymph node, then they move from the lymph node to the circulation and move back. They continue to keep doing that, so they keep moving from one lymph node to another and recirculate. If a naive lymph, uh, naive T cell recognizes an antigen during that, during its its stay in the lymph node, then it's going to be activated. It's going to be retained in the lymph node for longer time. It's going to undergo clonal expansion, then differentiation, and that activated T cell that differentiates into effector T cell is going to leave the lymph node, and instead of going for recirculation, it's going to actually go to the tissue. So that's the difference between a naive T cell that recirculates versus an activated T cell. And you can see this light, lighter red is the naive T cell that keeps recirculating, whereas the uh, activated T cell is going to go from the uh, lymph node and blood circulation to the tissue. We talked about high endothelial venules. These are present in lymph nodes or mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Um, the, these are developed in presence of cytokines like lymphotoxin. But high endothelial venules are places where the lymphocytes can come out from the circulation into the lymph, uh, secondary lymphoid organs. All right, so we talked about the recirculation of naive T cells, but how does it occur? How does the naive cell know when to stay in the, in the lymph node or leave and recirculate to another lymph node? So if there is tissue inflammation, there is increase in the blood flow to the lymph nodes. So there is increase in the T cell influx into the lymph node. But when with the tissue inflammation, there is decrease in the egress of T cells into efferent lymphatics. So that helps to kind of create a situation where there are more T cells coming in, but not as many going out. So they get longer time. And so T cells are retained in the lymph nodes longer and have a higher chance of meeting their cognate antigen. So, and then, so these naive T cells, remember they express CD62L or L-selectin, right? That helps them to interact with the selectin ligand on high endothelial venule or peripheral node addressing. So the peripheral node, addre the address that they bind to depends on the tissue. So the, in the lymph node, they bind to glycam-1, or in Peyer's patches in the gut, they bind to medcam-1. 
So L selectin can bind to different um, selectin ligands. Also, it's interesting because the L selectin can bind to MedCam1, which is also a CAM, right? So it's an integrin, uh, integrin ligand as well. The once that rolling or selectin to so selectin ligand occurs, there is firm adhesion using integrin and integrin ligands, and that happens with, with LFA1 on the T cells. And then the chemokines come into play, and the naive T cells are attracted because to the zone that has CCL19 and CCL21 that's released by the FRCs in T cell zones of lymph node. Why is that? Because these chemokines bind to CCR7 that's present on the naive T cells. Also, the high endothelial venules release CCL19, so that's their first signal for CCR7 uh, that's attached to the naive T cells to go to the lymph nodes. And then because of these two cytokines in the T cell zone, these end up in the T cell zone rather than going elsewhere in the lymph node. This one just shows how there are different homing receptors on naive T cells versus activated or affected T cells. So CCR7, L-selectin, and LFA1 versus other ones on activated T cells. This figure basically is showing the same thing, how they go from the endothelial venules into the lymph node, and then based on what their cytokines are, um, uh, sorry, chemokines are released, they end up in the T cell zone because they have T CCR7 on them. There is another concept called uh, CYP1 gradient. So when that um, lymph, uh, sorry, lymphocytes enter the lymph nodes, they typically have to get, they get out of the circulation rather than being uh, retained in the lymph node unless they come across their uh, antigen. And how does that happen? So there is something called CYP1 or sphingosin 1-phosphate that binds to its receptor CYPR1 on the T cells. The high concentration of CYP is present in blood and lymph, and when there is higher concentration in lymph and blood of, of CYP, the CYPR1 the receptor on the T cells is internalized. So then it follows the scent of CYP that is present. Um, uh, so, so it gets out of the circulation, it recirculates, and now as it there is because there is low uh, concentration in the tissues of C, uh, because of a, an enzyme called CYP lyase, there is re-expression of CYP R1 on naive T cells, and so they are brought back to the lymph node and they are retained for some time, and then they are again they recirculate. Once it's activated, if that naive T cell is activated, it expresses something called CD69 that binds to the CYP R1. And that's because of that, it becomes insensitive to the SIP gradient and is retained in the lymph node for longer time. After it differentiates into effector cells, it again loses CD69. So T effector cells do not have CD69. So they re-express the SIP R1 and become responsive to concentration gradient. So then they can leave the lymph node. Fingolimod is a immunosuppressant that can bind to the SIP R1 and that way they can retain the uh, T cells in the lymph node and they are not released in the circulation. So because of that, they act as an uh, immunosuppressant. Based on the different types of lymphoid organs, there are different selectins, integrins, chemokines that play a role to bring those cells to that tissue. For example, Peyer's patches and mesenteric lymph nodes in the gut have um, MADCAM1, so the naive T cells that express um, L-selectin and integrin alpha-4 beta-7 gets attracted to bind to MedCam1 in gut endothelium. So remember for MedCam1, you need integrin alpha-4 beta-7. And that's something it's, uh, that you do need to memorize. Spleen is different. There are no HEVs. There are no selectin or integrin mechanisms to enter the marginal zone or red pulp. It's free entry. CCR7 binding does play a role in, in uh, directing these cells to go to the white pulp. 
Once these cells become effector T cells, how do they end up in tissue? There is low CCR7 and L-selectin on the L-selectin on them, so they don't go to the lymph nodes, so they are in the circulation. But then at the site of infection, the effector T cells can the selectins on them can bind to selectin ligands, integrin ligands to integrins, and then chemokines help with binding to chemokine receptors and get out of the circulation to the tissues. Tissue-specific homing, we actually talked about this, but again, moving back to the same concept, gut homing needs different chemokines, integrins, so CCR9 interacts with CCL25, so any cell that has CCR9 on it will go to the gut where there is CCL25, CCL28 is present in gut, also in GU and lung, so any cell that has CCR10 on that will go to that site. MedCam1 binds to alpha-4 beta-7 integrin, so that's how it helps in gut homing. Skin homing, cutaneous lymphocyte antigen is a uh, selectin ligand and it binds E-selectin, CCR4 uh, in, and uh, CCR8 and CCR10 bind to their respective chemokines and help in skin homing. And remember clinically an alpha-4 beta-7 um, targeting molecule or drug is available called vedolizumab that helps in preventing uh, inflammation in the bowel. Memory T-cell migration, again, central memory cells have CD45RO, CCR7, L-selectin on them. Because they have CCR7 and L-selectin on them, they end up in the lymph nodes. So central memory cells stay in the lymph nodes, secondary lymphoid organs. Effector memory cells do not have CCR7 or L-selectin on them, so they stay in the tissues. All right, we talked about T-cells. Now we just kind of look at the B-cells and what are the differences. So B cells are produced in bone marrow, then they get into the circulation and go to the spleen. That's where they um, mature to become mature B cells. In the spleen, CXCR5 is the chemokine receptor on the B cells that helps in getting them to the follicles in the white bulb, which, is CX, which releases CXCL13. Once they are mature, they get into the circulation, and then from the circulation, they enter the lymph nodes. In the lymph nodes, they have CXCR4 and CCR7 both on their surface. Because of CCR7, they enter the lymph nodes. Because of CXCR4 they en and CXCR5, they enter the follicles. Um, or I guess CXCR4 helps them to enter the lymph nodes, but follicles require CXCR5 on their surface. Power patches, again, CXCR5 six, uh, binds to CXCL13. And then uh, also they need that gut-specific homing, so MedCam1 interacts with integrin alpha-4 beta-7. Then depending on their uh, differentiation into plasma cells, plasma cells home to bone marrow and tissue sites, and follicular B cells in spleen migrate to marginal zone and then uh, carry it through the red pulp and into circulation. CYP-R1 deficient B cells have diminished ability to leave the spleen. So CYP-R1 also plays a role in B cell migration. And then depending on the different types of cells, so IgA secreting plasma cells more in the gut, uh, IgG or mucosa, and then IgG secreting plasma cells, they come home more to the bone marrow. And then again, depending on the inflammation, they might go to the site of in, uh, inflammation. This figure basically just shows the same thing here uh, from the high endothelial venule, a B cell that is carrying uh, CCR7, CXCR4, and CXCR5 is going to home to a lymph node and then to the B cell follicle region. And then depending on if it's activated or not, it's going to stay there or move on. Um, and if it's going to stay there, it, in, it differentiates into a plasma cell and that will go to the bone marrow or IgA uh, plasma blast will go to the mucosa. All right, that was the last slide. We get to the post-test migration of leukocytes out of the blood into the tissues mainly occurs in which type of vessel? Anyone? I'm not 100% sure, but I was thinking it was like the post-capillary venules. Yep. Um, so so venules. Mm -hmm. 
So that's where the leukocytes go out of the, the blood into the tissues in the venules. Which of the following statements correctly describes the migratory behavior of naive T lymphocytes? They recirculate from blood into lymph nodes via high endothelial venules and back into the blood via lymphatics. They recirculate from blood into inflamed tissues via activated postcapillary venules back into blood via lymphatics. They migrate into the thymus via HEVs where they mature into effector T cells and then enter the blood via lymphatics. They are stationary or after maturation in thymus, they migrate into the blood via lymphatics, enter the spleen via high endothelial venules. Anyone? Remember, they are naive T cells, so they only recirculate to particular places. Is it A? It is A. That's correct, because they don't go into, if it, they are naive, they do, don't go into tissues. Um, they do not, re you know, the time is just isn't, Thymus doesn't play a role there, and they are not stationary. All right. That's it. Next one is Jeopardy. So for chapters 1, 2, and 3, uh, for next time, um, any questions? Or if you want to summarize, I think we have one minute. So if you guys want to go ahead and summarize. Well, um, I will take a stab at um, neutrophil migration. Um, so um, when neutrophils, so when there's an infection in the tissue and macrophages um, are at the site, they release um, cytokines that um, then um, are attracted or attract the neutrophils. And so then the neutrophils come um, come to the site infection by, um, by trans kind of migrating to the outer portions of the blood vessel first, yeah. and then they get, um, the selectin ligands on the neutrophil surface are up, like kind of upregulated, and then they bind to the selectin on the endothelium for the, like, slower rolling. Mm -hmm. And then there's chemokines that are released that, um, that are present as well that increase um, the integrin um, integrin kind of affinity. So you get the integrins that are on the oh integrins are on the endothelium, and then or no, I cams cams are on the endothelium. Uh, okay, okay, the cams are on the endothelium, and. Um, and then the integrins are on the cells, so then they bind in their low affinity state, but then the chemokine and chemokine receptor um, functioning or interaction causes them to go from low affinity to high affinity. And then they, um, they flatten out, um, and, um, and then they kind of trans-marginate um, through the endothelial cells to get into the tissue. Sounds good. All right. What else? I guess that was the main concept, um, but um, yeah, we'll we'll talk about the others, but try to memorize some of the, the names that we talked about, um, and then the pairs of chemokines and chemokine receptors that are important for homing. All right, so that's it. Thank you, everyone. And we'll Thank you. It's time for Jeopardy. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Dr. Rajay. Thank you.